majority of new businesses fail. And I think that's what drives me. You have to go into it thinking, okay, I need to think about this ahead of time. I need to get my ducks in a row. I need to have a business plan. I need to think about all of the contingencies. And then once you've gone through that, all that, and you're willing to accept the financial risk, the time risk, the energy risk, all of that, then you just have to go for it. Welcome to Forward with NACI, Inspiring Entrepreneurial Action, a podcast that shares the stories of everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and the communities that support us. We hope that this diverse collection of stories brings you inspiration, inspires you to take action, and ignites entrepreneurship in your community as we make our way forward together. Welcome to this episode of Forward with NACI. I'm Rebecca Corbin, and I'm very happy to be here this week with our special guest, Cynthia Bon Wheaton. And she, we are going to call her Cynthia. She's got a lot of really interesting life experiences to share and resources for uh, inspiring entrepreneurs. So, Cynthia, thank you for being with us today. I'm really happy that you're here. And we are going to jump right into it. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and maybe some of the experiences that you had that led you to your career path today? I think the most important uh, experience was that my father was an entrepreneur. And he used to say, I like to get up in the morning and go to work. I never know what will happen. It's always challenging. He had a manufacturing business with two brothers. And that stuck with me. I, so I always wanted to have my own business. And I went to Meredith College, majored in a combination of English and business administration, and got an MBA because I couldn't find a job I liked out of, <laughs> out of college. And I was accepted at UNC, Chapel Hill. And so I still had this, one day I'm going to have a business, one day I'm going to have a business. And when I was getting out of business school, I was interviewed for consulting jobs. And I thought, now that's interesting. But they wanted me to consult on things I didn't know much about. So I thought what I need to do is go and learn something, learn a business, and then maybe I'll start my own business. And that's the way it happened. I worked for large companies that I ended up starting new businesses within a corporation, which is a Mm -hmm. great way to learn the process. Years later, after about 12 years of management experience, I went out on my own for about 11 years and doing consulting work in database marketing, which was my particular expertise. And then in 2000, I twisted my husband's arm. We'd met at a consulting firm and I talked him into uh, joining me. He had, he did not have an entrepreneurial bone in his body. <laughs> so he was a little reticent to do that, but we, we had our own consulting business had have had um, partners and an office in Chicago and served, had great client relationships. Now I'm more in the, I'm still involved in the business, but I I do more writing now and speaking. Um, Entrepreneurship is a real passion of mine because it's such an answer for so many people. uh, But not everybody should be an entrepreneur. So part of What actually inspired me to write this book, Are You Ready to Start Your Own Business, was I saw people doing things they shouldn't be entrepreneurs, and I want to encourage people who should be. And so that's, it's really a lifetime of learning into what does it take to be successful? How do you pull the levers in a good direction? It sounds like what you're talking about, which is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, is really the power of entrepreneurial mindset. And it could be, you know, your husband's probably not a high risk taker, maybe a natural person like yourself to start a business, but he still, you know, obviously can think in terms of an entrepreneurial mindset and aligns with somebody like you because you've been married for a long time, but you've also had these different ventures. And I think that's what we teach at NACI is really you want this sort of crazy quilt of people that can be co-collaborators. Because if if you and I are collaborating on a business and we're both, you know, all in on everything, that maybe is not the best partnership. You know, we need to have 
differences and really understand ourselves. And um, I'm intrigued, you know, first of all, um, your your business background, I think, is, is phenomenal. But we have been interviewing other people for our podcast, and they give the same kind of advice that you give is really make sure if you're going to start a business that you understand it. Uh, one guest we interviewed recently said, you know, people will come up to him and say they want to start a restaurant. And, you know, he said, well, what do you know about operating a restaurant? And they said, I like food. And so, you know, hence the the importance of people like you, Cynthia, and, and, and our other people. I understand you wrote a book uh, that you just showed us a moment ago. Are you ready to start your business? So tell us a little bit about that process. Did you work with a publisher? How did you kind of come up with the content? Did you glean it from your years in the consulting uh, industry? Well, it had been in the back of my mind. My older child was leaving for college. And I was thinking, I didn't want to keep up the consulting pace I'd had. Um, I'd lost my father when he was 66. And I wanted to make sure I had time to do the things I really wanted to do. So I went to a writer's conference and realized that what I want to talk, what I want to write about, it, it kept saying, write what you know, write what you know. Well, I know about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the pieces I self-published because at that time there wasn't a lot of, um, there weren't a lot of opportunities. I didn't, you know, I wasn't a famous business person. I wasn't, had this extraordinary story to tell. I was a regular person who had been successful at entrepreneurship. So in that time, publishers, I just wasn't somebody they were going to be interested in. My story wasn't big enough. But it was the beginning of self-publication. And so I was encouraged to do that. And I did self-publish. And then, interestingly, I got in touch with Meredith, where I'd gone, and just said, what can I do? I want to, you know, I live nearby. I want to help with your entrepreneurship program because I understood they were just starting one. And by the way, I have this book. I was using it as a credibility. A lot of times speakers yes. will have a book, and it's right. all about credibility, not that they expect to, you know, make an income off of selling the book. And I gave it to them. And then the next thing I knew, one of the professors called and said, I'm using your book in my class on entrepreneurship. Can you, would you come in and speak to the class? And that's how that started. And then I found out on LinkedIn that somebody, it was also being used in a class at Carson Newman University in Tennessee. And I was amazed because that's not something I had even conceived of. So I became more, um, I started a website before that called The Entrepreneur's Friend, because in fact, when I was at this writer's conference, I woke up one morning and it happened to be the day, we have very long space between generations of my family, but it would have been my father's 100th birthday. And I oh woke up goodness. and in my head was The Entrepreneur's Friend. Because I didn't want to be a consultant again. I didn't want this to be a big, I wasn't going to build a big business, but I wanted to be kind of there for people who had questions about entrepreneurship. And so I started a website and blogged for several years. And so about not only aspects of business, but aspects of your personal life, relationships, health you know, mental and spiritual issues that are all part of who we are, as well as marketing and finance and things like that. So it's kind of a unique, it's a unique twist on the topic too, because what I hear a lot from people starting a business, I know even myself, when I, I left my job at the college to begin taking this role at NAC on entrepreneurship, people are like, why are you doing that? You don't know anything about entrepreneurship. But I learned through my journey and through some of my research that actually I was very entrepreneurial. I just was not a very high risk taker. Like I would place small bets on things. And so I wasn't what people would think about in terms of that big personality and things like that. But you said a couple other things I thought were really interesting about the book writing process in terms of how it gives you credibility. It gives you a, a door to, to open up and, and how what you put your sort of thought leadership into the form of something people can not only read, but they can teach a class from, that they can learn from. And then it gives you that 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 opportunity. 
I'm curious from your book, did you write it just yourself or did you interview other people? Uh, did you did you include other people in the process? No, I wrote it just myself. I use examples. I knew a lot of examples of just friends, business associates, different people who try things. You know, I heard of, I, I know at least two people who lost their homes because they bet their home and started a business. I know someone who bet, bet his home and uh, it paid off big time too. So I, I'm very cautious when I, in the book, when I talk about, you know, what your financial situation should be and maybe what you should be willing to invest. I'm fairly cautious. Because something like, it depends on when you read the statistics and who pulls them together, two and five new ventures work, the majority of new businesses fail. And I think that's what drives me. You have to go into it thinking, okay, I need to think about this ahead of time. I need to get my ducks in a row. I need to have a business plan. I need to think about all the contingencies. And then once you've gone through that, all that, and you're willing to accept the financial risk, the time risk, the energy risk, all of that, then if you've thought through everything and you still think it's a good idea, then you just have to go for it. But a lot of people don't think about it ahead of time. It's, oh, I I can have a restaurant. I can have a bookstore. We had some friends who he was going to retire and they thought, oh, we love books. We'll just start a little bookstore. Well, that was when books were going to online. And then they said, okay, that isn't going to work. So let's start a bread, a a bakery and we'll get corporate accounts. It's always good to have a B2B element to your business. We'll go corporate accounts. We'll provide breakfast for conferences and things like that. Well, right about that time, there was this big trend towards that bread was not a good thing. (laughs) Right. You have to pay attention to the market. So you never know. You never know. And the last time I spoke at Meredith was right before the pandemic shut everything down. And I talked to them a bit about my father started this business. It was a a building supply business. And one night it burned down. It just burned down. But they had a little piece of property somewhere else where they did a few concrete products you know, like bird baths and small ornamental things, benches and things. And they, the brothers looked at each other and said, okay, well, we're not doing anything else that's flammable. Let's go to the concrete products business. But their business burned down. And and I thought, gee, I hope I'm not scaring off all these potential entrepreneurs. And then within a month, everything was shut down and COVID destroyed a lot of businesses because the shutdowns were so extreme. So some people, some restaurants figured out how to manage and some didn't and they don't exist anymore. Yeah. So they're always unexpected challenges. Yeah, and I think what you're talking about too is what we think a lot about in terms of entrepreneurship, but also innovation. And the way I think about innovation is being very action oriented. So something burns down and you know you have a choice, you just, stop doing it and do something else, or you rethink and you repurpose. And I I feel like as a a community of people that love entrepreneurship and and education and students and things like that, that we probably became better innovators, those that stayed. There were a lot, there was mass exodus of students. And just with all of the colleges we worked with, they they lost a lot of, you know, faculty that just didn't want to teach on the online, you know, platforms and things like that. But it it seems to me, you know, just talking with, you know, leaders and people like you that, you know, the world is going to continue to change and the pace of acceleration is not going to slow down. So, you know, we have to decide, you know, how how do we want to engage with the world? And, and I think really knowing about some of the work that you do and, and just the fact that you volunteer your time to go and talk to classes at Meredith College. I think I had shared with you, I taught there as an adjunct, uh, prob- oh my goodness, 20 years ago now. But what I really appreciated about the spirit, it was an all women's school at that time. I don't know if it still is, but they really encouraged their adjuncts to like take the students out into the field. What I know today very well is experiential um, teaching and learning, which I didn't even know what that was. But, you know, when you're taking 18 year olds and trying to teach them public administration and they have no idea what that is. And you're in the city of Raleigh, you know, hey, why not go down to the, 
you know, the state house and things like that. So I, I think what you're doing, um, Cynthia, is really changing the world. And, and I would encourage people to look, um, take a look at your website. How the entrepreneur's friend is that like, can you spell that out for us? Yeah. So it's T H E E N T R E P R E N E U R S F R I E N D dot com. Mm-hmm. The entrepreneur's terrible. I mean, one of my key things about marketing is to make things simple. And that is not, but I decided to go with it anyway. But it's me- it's memorable. You know, we struggle that with, you know, the name of, of my organization, the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship is super long. Uh, NACI is memorable, but as people don't know what it is. <laughs> so, well, people in our sphere know what it is, but we're trying to amplify that. But it's, it's interesting. And you probably, as we start to bring our conversation to a close, I would love for you to give maybe a little bit of advice from your years of experience to people that may be listening and thinking about, you know, they have a passion for a certain area. You mentioned your friend that started a bookstore and some some other things. What, what, what advice would you have to people that are sort of toying around with either pursuing a business, maybe they have a traditional job now, or they find themselves in the in-between stage, maybe something happened with their job and they're thinking it might be time to go out on their own? Well, I have a couple of uh, suggestions. One is to keep your eyes open. People tend to gravitate towards the same thing. They think about restaurants. They think about whatever. I mean, keep your eyes open. Watch shows like uh, Mike Rose's show about uh, dirty jobs. I mean, there are jobs that people don't even know exist that they could make a good living starting a little business and doing that job. So keep your eyes open. It's funny. I I mean, my dad loved working in concrete products because it was intellectually challenging Mm -hmm. for him and he could make a good living for the family. I like being a consultant because it's intellectually challenging and we made a good living for our family. But keep your eyes open. See, look for a need. And when I worked for Legs Hosiery, the uh, hosiery company, we had a salesperson who used to come and take everybody out to lunch periodically because we were a big account for him. And, you know, a lot of salespeople would say, oh, you know, what are your hobbies or whatever? He would grill us about <laughs> how we did our work, what we, I mean, we didn't tell him trade secrets or, you know, our, what our marketing plans were, but he would ask us like, how does this work? How do you do this? He became one of the most successful entrepreneurs I've ever known in my life oh because my he listened, he asked questions and he listened. And then when he saw an opportunity, he was in a position to take it. The other thing I suggest is keep working the problem. Whatever is there, whether it's a business plan or you already have a small business, it's not working. Keep thinking about it. Keep changing things. There are levers in a business. You know, you can do things that are going to increase sales, but they increase your costs more. You got to keep things. You got to keep these levers in line. And they're basically the same levers for all businesses. They may just vary the way they work but in, in large scale. They work. And the other thing is so, so keep working the problem. And the final thing is it never hurts to ask. <laughs> if you have a question, if you want to track me down and ask me a question, you know, you may just catch me on a day when I'm happy to talk to you and and what it never hurts to ask somebody else. They may have time to help you. They may not, but they're always going to be flattered that you you cared enough to ask. So it, it just never. And then I got my first consulting job on my own because I said, OK. I sent letter. I sent emails out to all my friends. Letters, actually, it was before emails. That's how long ago it was. And somebody called up and said, "Oh, you know, I need I need help with this. Can you help me?" Or I called a friend later and said, "Just hi." He said, "What are you doing?" "Oh, you know what? I'm glad you called. I need a project. Can you help me with this project?" So it never hurts to ask and to um, touch base with somebody. 
I love that. And, you know, asking, I remember years ago in my career, I worked for the United Way system and they did all these studies, uh, you know, why, why do people give? Why don't they give? And so on and so forth. And the number one reason time after time after time they did this study is people did not give because they weren't asked. So, you know, I think that's maybe a universal thing. And, and I love your analogy of the, the levers or levers or whatever they call them to really be aware of that. And when you start to see trends, I know people are looking at P&Ls and we had another guest that was talking about the importance of really financial literacy. If you're going to jump into this business world, you have to understand cash flow and um, just really the basics of, of, of mechanics of that and keeping track of it. So Cynthia, I've learned a lot from you this morning. I, I'm really glad to meet you and I hope that people will um, visit the Entrepreneur's Friend website. And also, if they um, have a chance to pick up your book, whether they are teaching in a classroom or they're just looking for something to help them uh, on their journey. So, so thank you for the work that you do. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity. I love talking about entrepreneurship. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will continue to explore the many ways to define entrepreneurship with NACI as we celebrate opportunity, failing forward, and success, learning from one another along the way. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform and follow at NACI on social media and learn more about us at NACI.com forward slash podcast. Stay tuned for a new episode each week. We look forward to making our way forward together with you.